Thanks be to God. A very good afternoon to everyone. Today, we celebrate Small Group Sunday. Um, and I've picked this passage where we begin thinking about small groups, but from the perspective first and foremost of the church. And um, this passage in Hebrews, I think, gives us uh, quite a bit to think about. Okay, not quite a bit, just a little bit to think about, so not too much for us. I hope it's not, uh, it won't be overwhelming. All right, so let's begin first with an idea about church. What is church to all of you? Is it um, a place to go to? A people to gather with, um, a group of people with whom we learn together or we receive something from the Lord. Now, in the research done in America, I don't have data for Singapore, right? In the research done in America, researchers found that people did church for the following important reasons, right? And just focus on the dark blue bar. So starting from the top to the bottom where there were most respondents, right? So the top, the top reason is to become closer to God. And then so children will have moral foundation to make me a better person and so on. You know, just quickly look through it. Notice, I, I notice that most of these reasons are kind of functional in nature, right? To, to gain something, uh, to make me... Uh, you know, to, to help me become uh, spiritually such and such and so and so. Now, it seems that for people, going to church is one of the most important thing for their personal faith journey. And it feels like thinking of church as um, a method, uh, something, something helpful to help us become better persons, better Christians, no doubt, but to help us to become better people. I want you to know that this misses what church is all about. Church isn't a congregation of individuals trying to become better, uh, to be better persons. It's not even about people trying to get, become more spiritual with the help of each other. Church isn't about gathering so that we can personally become closer to God. If the effects of sin is separation, and church is God's solution, part of God's solution to sin, then church cannot be about us gathering together for the purpose of our separate personal growth. That word separate should not be part of the definition of church, because church is the solution to sin, and sin separates us. Instead, when we look at Hebrews 10, we see that the essence of church is simply being. The essence of church is simply Christians coming together as the body of Christ, and that is the church. Everything else that we do is a reflection, is an outworking of this reality in which we are part of. So church is about being part of something bigger and the result of that is that it makes us much closer to God and to each other. So three points that I want to share with you. The first is this. We begin here because Jesus is pivotal. The truth, we begin with this truth that Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus makes church possible. And in Hebrews, we find two reasons for this. One, the first reason is that Jesus is the new and living way through which the church can approach God boldly and with confidence. Without Jesus, there is no point of contact, there's no point of access to God, the church cannot exist. The second point, Jesus is the great priest who presides over the church. He ensures our continuous access, not just a one point in history access, but continuous access to God by the constant cleansing of our sins. And so the church, as that body of God, the house of God, we thrive under his constant presence and intercession. But we see this in Hebrews. It's stated out there in those words, new and living way, and Jesus as the great, the big, the great high priest. Now, In the Old Testament, access to God was limited and temporary. There was location tacked to it, 
with the temple being the key place. But even then, there was separation in the temple, right? There was a heavy curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, the, the place where God's presence is known to dwell, with the other holy places. And as we extend further and further from the temple, it becomes uh, kind of less and less in degrees of holiness. We covered that during church camp. However, during Jesus' sacrifice, as represented by that broken body of his, this curtain was torn and it unveiled a new way. And according to Hebrews, this way is not just new, it is alive, it is vibrant, it is eternal. And so these two things that we see on the screen, these are the benefits that Jesus has earned for the church. And note this, the benefits were earned for the church, his body, not simply for individuals personally. Now, in summary, for this first point, we want to say, we want to begin here, Jesus, this idea that Jesus is pivotal because he opens a way for all creation to come to God through the body, and that keeps the way, and Jesus keeps that way open all the time. That access point is open. So that's where we begin. Jesus is the head of the church. But Hebrews 10 tells us something else. He says that we have access, the confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is through his body. And with this, I want us to start thinking about the body of Christ. Now, there's quite a few steps to do, but let's go through this slowly. We understand Jesus' role, right? He is the head of the church. And at this point, if we borrow an idea from Paul's letters, I think it will help us appreciate this passage in Hebrews. Now, Paul says, if Jesus the Christ is the head of the church, then we are his body, right? Together, all of us, plus the Christians all over the world, plus the Christians uh, back through the time, together we constitute the body of Christ. When the author of Hebrews tells us that by the blood of Jesus, a new and living way is opened for us through his body, I think it highlights the importance of community as church, or church as community. But let me explain. There are many parts of scripture that describes the intimate relationship, right, the inseparable relationship between Jesus and the church. For example, Jesus and the church have been described as groom and bride, where two separate entities come together to form one body, right? Two separate things, persons, coming together to form one. Paul describes, Paul is the one who used this description as Jesus, for Jesus and the church as head and body. One cannot exist without the other. Except perhaps if you're kind of looking at, you know, watching horror movies where, you know, they kind of exist separately. But the reason why Paul brings these two together as head and body is because they're meant to exist together. Now, in a set of Christian catechism, which is just a set of standard teachings for all believers, this set of catechism describes the church as one, yet formed of two components, human and divine. And that is the mystery of the church, right? As we say, when we gather as a church, that word assumes that God is already here, right? Church is formed of two components, holy and divine, and that is a mystery which only faith can accept. So there is no church without God, and Dare we push it one step further to say that God would not exist as God without the church. Jesus would not be Jesus without humanity of which the church represents his body. Which means that there will be no longer a time in human history where Jesus would exist without his church. That's how close he has brought us into the divine family. And so if we take seriously the idea that Jesus and the church are one and united, he in us and we in him, then could it be that the new and living way described here in Hebrews is new because it refers to this newly constituted church, this new passageway through which many can come to God and Jesus is the head of which. Could the new and living way be living because it is made up of living persons 
most clearly represented by the living sun, just like how the living stones can come together to make a living temple with the spirit of the living God dwelling in it. And could it be that this new and living way is now open through his body, which is, of course, the body of Christ broken on the cross, but in some divine mystery, that body of Christ would not exist without the body we call the church. And so we have access to God through Jesus in community. Let me say again, we have access to God through Jesus in community. This access is through a spirit-filled, tangible body of believers, also known as the church, of which, of which Jesus resides as the head. In other words, we don't really have access to God through Jesus, independent from the body of Jesus, the body of Christ. At least, that's not how it, it was designed. Now, I'm not saying that we cannot have those personal, intimate moments with Jesus, those moments of spiritual communion as a person with our personal God. It is possible. I'm not saying that's not possible. But in his plan for his creation to come to him, it would be through this body called the church. So God has decreed that we can come to him through Jesus who has united himself with the church and will never again be separated from the church. And here I speak of church as that high divine ideal of which we are part of and we are striving towards. And so the church is not just an assembly of individuals who have received individual benefits from the things Jesus had done. Instead, the church is one body that receives all the benefits of Christ and we only fully enjoy these benefits when we are part of the body of Christ. The implication of this is significant. This means that church, in the best sense of the word, all right, church isn't an optional part of our faith journey. Church is the gateway through which we confidently approach the presence of God. Church embodies that new and living way that was opened by Jesus. So in summary, church isn't just a place. We know that. It goes beyond a collection of people. Church is the new and living way to access God made possible by Jesus. But the only reason why we would say, mm, not really, is if Jesus is separate from the church. But that's not how he has designed it to be. The church exists because of this divine and mysterious transformation brought about by Jesus' sacrifice, sacrifice, and it is sustained by the ongoing intercession of Jesus, our great high priest. So that's who we are. We are the body of Christ. We are one and united with Christ and with each other in ministry to all the world. Now, moving on to the third point, with Jesus as the head, we are the body, the head and the body inseparable. The third point in Hebrews brings it down to practical living. And here it speaks about how life is like in the body of Christ. According to Hebrews, the response of the church to Jesus' work in making us the church, our most immediate response is to be interested in each other's lives. Being interested in each other's lives has two main components, at least according to this passage. One, we consider one another. And two, we spur one another toward love and good deeds. So the first point, there's that word, the key word there, consider. Consider. It means to pay deep and careful attention. Like when Jesus spoke about considering the lilies in the fields and how God takes care of them. Pay deep and careful attention to these beautiful things in nature, according to Jesus, for there you can see the Heavenly Father's love 
for even these lower level things, you know, how much more his love for each one of us created in his image. So paying deep and careful attention. And here Hebrews tells us to pay deep and careful attention to each other's lives, to fix our eyes and minds on one another's matters, being attentive, being focused on helping each other. Now, this point alone is extremely challenging if you are not actively part of a church or if you are not simply not interested in the lives of fellow believers. So we agree, point one, Jesus is our head. Two, yes, church is a body. But without being in community, it's impossible to carry on and to obey this instruction. And then there's a second point. We consider how we may spur one another on. What does that mean? Why should I do it? The word spur can also be translated to, to provoke, to incite, to strongly stimulate. As, you know, it's, it's a word that perhaps we can use to describe how we, we stir burning coals in a barbecue when the flame is dying and the coals are separate. We kind of use a, a, a tongue and we stir it and we push it together. And as those burning coals come together, the fire will burn hotter. And perhaps that's what we are meant to do with one another. To stir and to encourage each other to burn brightly for Jesus. Our role in our church community is then to challenge, to provoke, to, to motivate one another to experience Jesus in our midst, to experience what it means to be church simply as doing life together. And not just that, also spurring one another on towards not just loving each other, loving God, but also to the life of doing good deeds. Again, something that is quite impossible for us to do when we are not plucked into each other's lives. And so while our Sunday service, our Sunday gathering, and we've, we've been kind of describing this space, this one and a half hour space each week as a place where all Christians, no matter what our social economic status, no matter our age, no matter um, our bearings, we can, we can come together and simply by coming together, we are witnessing that God, Jesus is indeed our head and we are indeed his body and there's nothing that separates us uh, in the love of Christ. And while this kind of congregation can serve as a place where considering and spurring can happen, may I suggest that it is easier for each one of us to begin in small groups. In my opinion, small groups are where we can put into practice what it means to be the body of Christ. These are places where we are actually known to someone else and others are known to us. Small groups are places where we cannot just waltz in and we waltz out. While we can waltz in to say, guys, I'm not ready to, ex to share with you more of my life, but at, le at least we waltz in and we share that it's a state of our soul right now. In the words of Hebrews, this is where, this is the place where we come together to live out love and good deeds. Now, it is difficult to consider, now, in our congregation, Every week, about 300 of us gather together. It is difficult for us to consider, in, in, in this sense, consider the lives of 300 other persons. But surely God has given us the capacity to consider just 8 to 10 other persons in a group. It may take a whole year for you or for me to spur another 300 persons in their faith, assuming you spur one person a day, taking breaks in between. But thankfully, if all of us do church together, we would have more than 300 pairs of hands to do the work of spurring. And so in a small group, we constantly spur and be spurred on, perhaps possible to do it on a weekly basis. Now, for little children, you have a part to play as well. Do you know that as you come here in our presence and you participate in the singing and in the dancing, your presence also spurs us on to be faithful to God, to push us on like hot coals, seeing your passion and your energy, and it brings 
passion and energy to us as well. Same goals for teens and youths. You are part of the church and your response to Jesus is also the same as what is said in Scripture, to be interested in each other's lives. Be interested in the lives of other teens and other youths and going beyond that age category, be interested in the lives of the adults as well. And earlier we spoke, I spoke to the, the, seniors, the seniors group about how as we do life together and we disciple each other in our age group, we have more to give, more to give not just within the age group of the seniors, but to pour the kind of life and energy and experience and resources into the people who are younger than us. And then among us, whether you're a young person or you're an adult, God has given some of us greater capacity to be interested in the lives of more than just eight to 10 persons. God may want you to serve him by caring for larger communities, maybe the group of seniors, the group of teenagers, the group of children, the group of school-going children, the group of working adults, a group of professionals, a group of singles, a group of retirees, or perhaps whole congregations. And if that is how God is pushing you and how he's nudging you, if that's how the Spirit is guiding you, then please rise to the occasion as a group leader, as a ministry leader, or as a pastor. And the reason we do this is because Christ is our head. We are the body. By coming together, that is what church is. And if being church, and being, being church simply means being interested in each other's lives. Now, you've heard me share about my, my small group. You've heard me share sometimes about my band meetings and how we meet together to confess our sins to one another. I, I don't think you want to hear me share the same thing. So today, I've invited uh, Julian. He's prepared a little bit of his experience uh, growing up in church and being part of a small group. And I'm going to hand the time to him to let him share with you. And then after that, I will, I will take the time back. As well has gone into quite a lot of detail on the theology of small group and you know, what it means to be in a church community. And I thought I'd just share a bit of an, my experience of uh, being in a small group. So I've been in a small group for more than 15 years now, and it has helped me grow in my Christian work, definitely. Um, I'll just highlight two ways of how it has contributed to my Christian work. So um, firstly, while we get our spiritual nourishment every Sunday from the pulpit, uh, a typical service doesn't really allow us to uh, dive deep into a passage uh, or a particular theme for that matter. You know, we can't just raise our hands and ask the pastor to clarify certain points that we are unsure of. So in a small group setting, it really helped me explore scripture to a deeper extent, uh, which really allows for a richer appreciation of the text. Uh, facilitated discussions also allow us to ask questions uh, in a safe space. And while the group would not always have the answer, I think the process of discussing uh, the topics is very important. You know, it opened my mind to different interpretations of how scripture can relate to people in different situations and thereby widening my perspective. Yeah, so I think this is one way small groups have allowed me to grow. Uh, second, while the small group that I am familiar with focus a lot on book or thematic studies, uh, we recently started doing this thing called class uh, and band meetings, which I think some of you are familiar with. Uh, and this has really changed the way I relate to my church community. While there's a time and space uh, for gaining spiritual knowledge through Bible study, I think what was lacking in my Christian work was a safe space to share honestly about my struggles uh, as a Christian in the workplace, uh, being a husband, being a friend, so on and so forth. Uh, class meeting allowed me this space to share authentically about my, my faith, uh, not just, you know, sometimes surfacing surface layer prayer requests, which are important, but do not actually go to the heart of the issue. Um, but it really allowed me to share deeper, um, not to find solutions, but so that in sharing, we can pray for one another and hear others' perspective of how God might be working through my struggles. Uh, because often when we are in the midst of encountering a war in our spiritual faith, uh, it's difficult to see past our own problems. So hearing from the Christian community where we share the same values and convictions is important in our walk with Christ. Uh, band meetings, on the other hand, allow me to share and confess uh, my sins to a group of trusted brothers. 
They keep me accountable and more importantly, reassure me that no sin is too dark and beyond the saving grace of Christ. I must admit, uh, van meetings need some getting used to because you must be willing to be vulnerable and you must be willing to share openly your, your deepest, uh, darkest sins. I mean, you don't have to go that far, but as a starting point, you do need to share your sins so that you can reaffirm each other of uh, God's saving grace. Uh, but when you do so, you'll be able to experience Christian community in a whole new way. I think just ask yourself honestly, how many of us you know, have struggled with sin alone and vowed to change by ourselves using our own strength, but then falling into the same sinful habit over and over again and feeling discouraged? Um, by ourselves, it's sometimes difficult, almost impossible to break out of certain habits. I'm not saying that band meetings will definitely magically make us sinless, but it helps to be accountable to a group for our sins. So uh, with all this being said, I think being able to share honestly in a small group setting um, changed the whole texture of my Christian walk. Uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage everyone who's you know, seeking a deeper experience uh, of Christian living, uh, not just during Sunday service, uh, to consider giving small groups a try. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. We are the holy body of Christ, right? And God does have great plans for each of us and intends to weave each one of us into his greater plan for this world. And he wants us as the church to be part of it. We can begin by being serious about these calls, our own lives, our own walk with God. And we come together and we spur each other on in love and good deeds. And so for those of us who are not yet part of a group, my encouragement to you is very straightforward. Simply join a group, right? Take that first step of faith. There are others around you. You know, you may not know everyone, uh, but speak to, Julian is our small group coordinator for adults. Roger is, where's Roger? Right, our youth coordinator. Uh, and we have many leaders who are also in a small group. You can approach me as well. And we will, we will help you find a group that is most suitable for you. Now, some may wonder, why is it crucial to attend a small group when we can worship or study the Bible individually? Now, as Julian said, small group offers a unique opportunity for us to be church. Not a unique opportunity for us to gain more tools to, to kind of sharpen my own spirituality. It's not, it's, not that, it's not about utility. Small group is an intimate gathering, right, where you find a space where deep relationships can form with fellow believers. A place where we share our joys and struggles, where we seek guidance from God, where we experience what community means. Of course, it does provide a supportive environment for personal and spiritual growth. That's, that definitely is part of it. And there will be opportunities to study God's word together, to pray for each other, to encourage one another. And so, but what's critical is that simply we come together and we are known by each other and together we come to that same intimate and deep knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you haven't already, I invite you to explore the world of small groups in our church where you can experience you know, just a, a, a little bit of what it means to be church. But for those of us already in a group, small groups are still that same place where we practice what it means to be, in a, com to be a community of believers. But I just want to... to kind of put it out there, right? There's small groups like any other aspects of church. They are not perfect, right? They are not immune to flaws. And there will be days when we feel like we are not gaining much from attending small groups. There will be times when we feel tired and we may be tempted to skip small groups. There may be even times when we feel hurt or offended by someone or something in the small group. And that's part of what it means to be church, to be community, to be a gathering of imperfect people en route to Christian perfection. The essence of small groups lies in the mutual encouragement and exhortation we provide for one another. 
And maybe also those opportunities to have our toes stepped on. And then you, you, you discover that, oh, actually, I'm not such a patient person. You know, even though I think that I've kind of overcome this issue of anger, but uh, it's still seething somewhere there. Small groups are places where we sharpen each other's faith, just like iron sharpens iron. And so in these intimate settings, as we build trust in each other, then we can open up about our challenges, we seek guidance, and in the words of Hebrews, to spur one another toward love and good deeds. So if you, who are already in a small group, if you find yourself hesitating to attend a small group, perhaps it's time to reflect again on the significance of these gatherings. In Hebrews 10, if you can push down a little bit to verse 25, we are reminded not to forsake gathering together. Yes, this command applies first and foremost for our big gatherings, but it also applies and extends to our small group meetings. Small groups are then places where we experience a deeper sense of community and mutual care. So remember, church isn't merely a place for the purpose of individual growth or personal experience. And if church is not the place for that, small groups are not also the place to meet that need. Because we are first and foremost a church rather than a collection of individuals. So in conclusion, as I draw this sermon to a close, I hope we can remember that our faith in Christ is not a solitary journey. It is a communal adventure where Jesus himself has paved the way for. Just to recap, in Hebrews 10, in 19 to 21, we saw the foundation upon which the church stands. The reason why we even gather as a large community and we meet as small communities. Jesus, the one who grants us access to the presence of God our Father, who is the living way, who serves as the great high priest over the house of God, it is through his sacrifice and his body that we have the privilege of approaching God with confidence. Jesus is the reason why our church community exists in the first place, and he is the reason why we are encouraging small groups. And as we pushed on from Hebrews 10, 22 to 24, we understand that our faith is not meant to be lived in isolation. If Jesus, the body of Jesus, if that body is the true and living way, and in his divine plan and mystery, he has taken the church and he said, I am the head, you are my body. I'm going to be united with you as man is to husband, and that unity will be for eternity. Then we must understand that we cannot live out our faith in isolation. We live it out as the body of Christ, and the other word we use for that is church. So being church means that we draw near to God. We hope fast to our hope, and we spur one another on. And then in Hebrews 10.25, we, we learned about this command not to forsake gathering together. And we, ex, we are going to extend this to our small groups. These gatherings are where we experience the reality of Jesus' work in our lives. Because in these smaller groups, there are people who know me more deeply who know my deeper struggles, who understand my past traumas, who are, who, who, are, who are familiar with my current struggles. They rejoice with me when I am victorious and they spur me on in holiness. Small groups enable us to exercise these details of what it means to be church. And Jesus has made this possible. He has brought us together as a family of God. So in conclusion, let us remember and we praise God that his son, our Lord Jesus, is really the author, the genesis, the perfecter of our faith. He has given us the gift of the church and the blessing of small groups. He has laid that foundation, he's opened up the way, and he has called us to build on it. So let us cherish our church. Let us appreciate the fact that there are people here willing to be part of a small group with me. 
And let us embrace these small groups as places of mutual encouragement, of growth, and of care. Jesus has done it all for us. He has made church community possible. So let our response be to do church together, to be church And then to consider each other, that's our response, to consider each other and to spur one another on as we eagerly anticipate the day of the Lord's coming. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we we thank you because we have come into this faith for the the, the reason that there there were people in our lives who were interested in bringing us to walk more closely with Jesus. Perhaps the people who had evangelized to us, perhaps our parents who had brought us up in the, in, in the faith, or maybe even people who did not intend to share the faith with us, but somehow in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we had learned a little bit more about Jesus from them. Really, Lord, even our coming to you in faith is not a solitary effort. And what more, Lord, you have given us this blessing called the church, called the body of, your, of, of Jesus. And you have encouraged us and you have planted us in here to be a member of this body. So today we want to respond to you in thanksgiving for those of us who are not in a community, a smaller community yet. Would you give us the courage to take that step to trust another person with our lives as Christians. And for those brothers and sisters who are already in a group, help us to not forsake meeting together regularly. Help us to be more interested in someone else's lives. Help us to be interested in their lives through prayer, through scripture, through fellowship, through meals, whatever it takes, Lord. Let us use every means of grace to be interested in one another. We thank you for your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come and fill us, to empower us, and to make living as church a reality. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.